Yesterday, intuitive machines attempted a touchdown on the moon for a second time. Unfortunately, just like the first attempt, it landed but tipped over, leaving it on its side. To make matters worse, due to its exact landing location and its relation to the sun and temperatures, the lander is out of power and not expected to recharge, effectively ending the mission. This means practically all the payloads aboard that were hoping to gather data and conduct surface operations will not be able to. Here I'll go more in depth into the landing, what went wrong, comments from intuitive machines, and more. Hours before the lander made contact with the ground, it completed the descent orbit insertion burn. Here, the main engine fires to slow the lander so that its minimum altitude drops from 100 kilometers to around 10 near the landing site. A few hours after this burn, the official livestream began, which was scheduled to last around one hour before the lander touched down. At this point, everything was operating as expected, and teams confirmed the lander was in good health. This led to the next major milestone, a part of the landing, the Power Descent Initiation, or PDI. At G minus 14 minutes and 26 seconds, G for ground, we got confirmation of engine ignition and the start of the PDI. This burn is intended to last for 11 minutes and reduce the lander's velocity by approximately 1800 meters per second to land softly on the surface. By G minus 3 minutes and 26 seconds, mission control called out 11 minutes in. Around this time, the mission teams were expecting the pitch over maneuver, which uses the main engines to orient the lander vertically in preparation for touchdown. Here, the livestream provided some interesting data, such as distance from the moon going far into the negatives. It's also worth noting that leading up to this final descent, they would made it clear that a loss of comms was expected due to the lander's position. Either way, we were still hearing good calls from mission control. It's important to point out that at this point in the mission, the lander was operating autonomously. For this reason, mission control was looking at any and all data, but they themselves weren't exactly sure of the state of the lander. What they did know is that they were expecting touchdown by right about now. Over the next 20 minutes, mission control and teams were walking around talking to each other, trying to get an idea of what condition the lander was in and whether or not it was upright. Around 14 minutes after the estimated touchdown time, the flight director said, to the vehicle. All right team, Here keep working the problem. We're shedding power as fast as we can to keep the vehicle in good health. We are generating power. We are communicating through our telemetry radio and we are working to evaluate uh, exactly what our orientation is on the surface. Not long after, the livestream somewhat abruptly ended, and we were left in the dark regarding the state of the lander and its future. That was until this morning, when the company released one image from the lander's onboard camera, in addition to an official statement. First, just looking at the image, it's very obvious with the two landing legs up in the air that the lander's on its side. Based on the image, it looks almost perfectly horizontal. In the statement, the company said, Athena landed 250 meters from its intended landing site in the Mons Mutin region of the lunar south pole, inside of a crater. This was the southernmost lunar landing and surface operations ever achieved. Images downlinked from Athena on the lunar surface confirmed that Athena was on her side. After landing, mission controllers were able to accelerate several program and payload milestones, including NASA's Prime 1 suite, before the lander's batteries depleted. They go on to say, with the direction of the sun, the orientation of the solar panels, and extreme cold temperatures in the crater, Intuitive Machines does not expect Athena to recharge. The mission has concluded, and teams are continuing to assess the data collected throughout the mission. This southern pole region is lit by harsh sun angles and limited direct communication with Earth. This area has been avoided due to its rugged terrain, and Intuitive Machines believes the insights and achievements from IM-2 will open this region for further space exploration, they said. This made it clear that in less than 24 hours after making contact with the surface, the mission was officially over. As mentioned in the statement, the specific landing location caused additional issues. The lander being on its side is a massive inconvenience. However, in some cases, it can still operate and charge its batteries. We got a perfect example of this during the IM-1 mission, when the lander, despite being on its side, actually lasted a few days before running out of battery and the mission concluding. That being said, even looking at the image, you can see that the lander is in a heavily shadowed region, inside the crater. This combined with the temperatures means the mission is over, and the next opportunity will be IM-3. In addition to the official statement released this morning, yesterday, a few hours after touchdown, there was a NASA news conference with intuitive machines. At that point, they still didn't have any images and weren't sure the exact orientation of the lander. The CEO of Intuitive Machines was quoted saying, Now, we think that we've been very successful to this point. However, I do have to tell you that we don't believe we are in the correct attitude on the surface of the moon yet again. I don't have all the data yet to say exactly what the attitude of the vehicle is. We're collecting photos now and downlinking those, and we're going to get a picture from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter camera from above from orbit and we'll confirm that over the coming days, as we get that data down, he said. In regard to the situation, he went on to say, I can say though that we are charging on the surface. We have commanding uplink and downlink from the vehicle to our ground network. So we're communicating. 
We can command payloads on and off, we can send commands to the vehicle, and we have powered down and done some power conservation steps as prudent measures to see how long and what objectives we can accomplish in the mission going forward. When we get that full assessment, we will then work closely with NASA, science and technology groups to identify science objectives that are of the highest priority. And then we'll figure out what the mission profile will look like. It will be off nominal because we're not getting everything that we had asked for in terms of power generation, communications, etc., he said. The panel eventually was asked questions with one being, what exactly is the orientation of the lander? The CEO responded, as far as orientation goes, there's conflicting data that we saw. If you listened to the live stream, you heard the prop console propulsion element call out that they had pressure in the combustion chamber, and that would indicate that the vehicle was upright. We had another conflicting measurement that in the IMU, the Z direction, which is horizontal, was pointing upright. So that would say it was on its side. We went and found that there was gas in the combustion chamber that was giving us a false read that the engine was running but at idle, and we think that was incorrect. And that in fact, that IMU data is the piece of data that says we're oriented somewhat on our side. But I want to get all the measurements and the pictures to really be able to explain to you the configuration of the vehicle. I don't have a good sense of that today, he said. Another question pressed this issue and he responded, the IMU measurement was that piece of data that gave us the most clarity. So we think that's the case. I would like to get a picture though to get the orientation of exactly where the antennas are pointing, where the engine bell is pointing, where are the solar panels, so that we can figure out a power profile. We know we can communicate with the payloads. We can talk to them and command them on and off. So if we can figure out the orientation correctly with imagery, we can then develop a power profile like I said, and then result in a series of priorities in the science and technology list that would allow us to capture some mission objectives. Turn on the drill, turn on the mass spectrometers for example, sniff for water as we vent the LOX tank, with the Hungarian sensor, or with M-Solo, the Prime 1 drill package. So there's quite a number of objectives that we can meet, he said. Unfortunately, since this news conference, a lot of the goals mentioned by the CEO related to work with payloads or power generation seem to be off the table. In one last quote from the chief technology officer at Intuitive Machines, he commented, After IM1, the team got together and we made a list of all the things we had learned. What do we need to change for the next mission? We had 65 items. 10 were critical. The others were, if we can get these in for IM-2, we will, but if not, they can wait for IM-3. The improvement from the last mission to the next mission really in less than a year, when you consider that you have to be at the Cape early, you have to be done with testing before that. We took a little bit of time off after working really hard on the first mission. That's building, improving, and shipping a new spacecraft to go to the moon in nine months. I'm incredibly proud of how this vehicle performed. And I'll tell you, the future is bright for intuitive machines to land lots and lots of cargo on the moon, he said. Intuitive Machines has landed on the moon, but similar to the last mission, it again is on its side. Combine this with the landing location and the vehicle is out of power and not expected to recharge, ending the mission. We will have to wait and see how it progresses and the impact it has on the space industry. Thank you very much for watching.